Happy Friday. I'm Paul Wontorek, and this is The Broadway Fix for October 16th, 2020. Later in the show, Charlie Cooper is catching up with three of the stars of David Byrne's American Utopia, premiering this weekend on HBO. But first, I'm bringing in Beth Stevens for some news. Good afternoon, Beth. Hi, Paul. Well, it's a rainy day on Broadway, but some theater stars got some sunny news yesterday, didn't they? Yes, they did. Just like that, James Monroe Eichelhart, the Tony-winning genie from Broadway's Aladdin, made the Tony nominations appear six months after they were originally scheduled to be announced. Only 18 productions eligible this year, down from 34 last year during a season that was cut short, of course, by the coronavirus pandemic. Jagged Little Pill, the high-energy Alanis Morissette musical, leads the musical race with 15 nominations, followed closely by Moulin Rouge with 14. Meanwhile, Jeremy O'Harris's slave play garnered 12 nominations, making it the most nominated play in Tony history. Now, there's no date or host or details for the Digital Tony Awards, but the ceremony during this bizarre and bittersweet time for Broadway will sure be one for the record books. Now, Beth, if you don't mind, I would like to share some more fun facts about this year's hopefuls. In a confusing first, Moulin Rouge star Aaron Tveit is racing against himself as the sole nominee in the leading actor in a musical category, which means that 60% of voters will have to give him the thumbs up for him to take home a trophy. With 15 nominations, Jagged Little Pill didn't beat Hamilton's record of the most noms ever at 16, but it did tie with the showings of Billy Elliot and the producers and received honors for all six of its stars, which is pretty incredible. I'd also love to shout out Audra McDonald, who landed her ninth Tony nomination for Frankie and Johnny and the Claire de Lune, Jane Alexander of Grand Horizons, who now has eight, and Moulin Rouge's Danny Burstein, who is up to number seven. Now, McDonald already has six Tonys, Alexander has one, but Burstein has a Tony-less mantle for now. We have some casting news for a couple of Broadway leading ladies. Mean Girls Queen Bee Renee Rapp is set to star in the new HBO Max comedy series, The Sex Lives of College Girls. The show, written and produced by Mindy Kaling, follows the lives of four roommates at a prestigious university. The series will also feature Alia Chanel Scott, who was recently seen as Navalungi in the Book of Mormon national tour. Meanwhile, Christiani Pitts, the former star of Broadway's King Kong, is set to appear in an upcoming Alicia Keys Netflix film. The untitled romantic comedy is about an aspiring pop star who ends up as the entertainment at her ex-fiance's wedding. We're looking forward to hearing more about that one when information becomes available. Finally, David Byrne's American Utopia has announced a Broadway return starting on September 17th, 2021. Don't want to wait? Have a TV and an HBO subscription? We've got good news in our weekend top three to see. I'm Caitlin Moynihan, and here's your top three to see. Heidi Schreck's acclaimed What the Constitution Means to Me is officially streaming on Amazon Prime Video. Captured during the play's final week on Broadway last season, this powerful piece is directed by Marielle Heller and tells the true story of Shrek putting herself through college by giving speeches about the U.S. Constitution. Tonight at 8 p.m., a concert of the new musical Sticks and Stones premieres on broadwaycares.org. Audra McDonald, Javier Munoz, and George Salazar star in this retelling of the biblical story of David and Goliath to address the issue of teen bullying. This free event is in benefit of Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS, and the Born This Way Foundation. Tomorrow is going to be one fine day because David Byrne's American Utopia is premiering on HBO and HBO Max at 8 p.m. Directed by legendary Oscar winner Spike Lee, American Utopia is a theatrical concert that you're not going to want to miss. I'm Beth Stevens, and it's time to get homeschooled about the great American playwright Eugene O'Neill. O'Neill is known for his legacy of more than 50 plays and for bringing a big dose of realism to the American theater. He often wrestled with his troubled past through his characters. What troubled past, you ask? Let's get into it. Born on this day, October 16th in 1888, you could say O'Neill's difficulties began almost at birth. He was born in a New York City hotel room on 43rd and Broadway, and soon after, his mother Mary became a morphine addict due to the difficult delivery. 
O'Neill spent the early part of his life traveling from theater to theater with his father, James, and their family. James was an alcoholic actor whose most famous role was the Count of Monte Cristo. Their dysfunctional family relationships, fueled by depression, drug addiction, and alcoholism, served as the basis for O'Neill's masterpiece, Long Day's Journey Into Night, which was produced in 1956, three years after the playwright's death. O'Neill was educated at boarding schools and went on to Princeton, where he was reportedly expelled for drunkenly throwing a bottle out of the window of Professor Woodrow Wilson, yes, the future U.S. president. He went on to travel the world, but suffered from malaria and tuberculosis, which landed him in the hospital. This offered time for reflection, resulting in a decision to devote himself to writing for the theater. Influenced by Chekhov, Strindberg, and Ibsen, O'Neill wrote a long string of naturalistic tragedies, including Desire Under the Elms, Morning Becomes Electra, A Moon for the Misbegotten, and The Iceman Cometh. His works have won four Pulitzer Prizes for drama, and he is the only American playwright awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, which he won in 1936. He died as he was born, in a hotel room, in Boston in 1953. Six years after O'Neill's death, Broadway's Coronet Theater on West 49th Street was renamed for him. And here's a final fun fact. Although there have been well over 50 productions of the playwright's work on Broadway, None of them have played the Eugene O'Neill Theater. We are here with three of the 11 stars of David Byrne's critically acclaimed Broadway show, American Utopia, that's since been turned into a Spike Lee-directed film. Right now, we have Jacqueline Acevedo, Angie Swan, and Chris Guillermo. Nice to meet you guys. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So you guys went from the Hudson Theater to HBO, and for a lot of you guys, it, it was your Broadway debut. What does that feel like? For me, it's been like this insane journey. I've worked with Annie B, the choreographer of the show, for like 15 years. Wow. So it's interesting to do a piece that feels so similar to all of the work that I've been doing downtown and in Brooklyn mm -hmm. for a decade plus, and see it at this level and with this kind of you know, support and exposure. So it's it's a really surreal experience for me because it doesn't feel like anything new. It feels just like a dance theater piece that I'm in at the kitchen, just happen to be singing, you know, some of the most iconic pop rock songs of the 20th century with the man that wrote them. Um, but <laughs> so casual that, about it. No, yeah. but, <laughs> but truly, for, <laughs> formally, it really does just feel like a kind of devised theater piece that we all made together. And I think that's, <laughs> maybe helped keep us a little humble during this because we're just like a dance company that, you know, happens to play awesome music too. <laughs> yeah. I, um, from on my end, it's like, I, I wasn't on the tour with uh, Chris and, and Angie, but um, I joined for the Broadway portion of it. But that was really cool for me because that was actually like a block away from my um, high school. So wow. yeah, it's one of those moments where, I mean, I had studied dance, I'd studied theater and I uh, studied a number of, of arts. And I uh, came into it as a percussionist, but had the privilege, of course, to be able to do Annie B's choreography. And, um, but then uh, I'd always wanted to do film. So this was like mind-blowingly dream come true, especially with Spike directing it. Uh, so having those two geniuses, you know, at the, at the helm of that and um, a bunch of other geniuses too, like, like we mentioned Annie B already, but like Spike and, and David Byrne working together, for me, I thought, this is just, nothing's been done like this before. It was really inspiring. Oftentimes when things are taken from the stage to film, the concern might be, is this going to translate? Is, it, is the message still going to feel the same? Is the, you know, the energy still going to feel the same? Um, I know that you guys were in the Hudson Theater performing this, and I know it's an intimate space. Now you're bringing it into someone's most intimate space, their mm -hmm. homes. So can you kind of speak on how performing at the Hudson maybe will help this translate a lot better. It's interesting because on the road we did uh, I think 240 something shows and every space was different uh, yeah. and so we were really used to kind of just going with the flow and figuring out adapting to whatever space we're in uh, and I, I think you know when we got to the Hudson it was this extreme weird kind of comfort that we weren't used to to be in the mm -hmm. same place over and over again literally not a different theater every every day which is what we did on the road um yeah. and so i think it was like this perfect 
timing of like Spike coming in when we were in this like really deep stride of the show of having created this energy on the road and then coming into this space and really honing it. And the one thing that I think I'll, I experienced when just meeting, meeting Spike and his crew, I mean, most of his crew are, are people that have worked with him since the beginning. Like yeah. the camera people were, are all like DPs and directors in their own right. And they come back and work with him because they respect him and he's created mm-hmm. this incredible art family. And that was amazing because we suddenly saw like, we feel like this weird art family. We've always mm-hmm. felt like that. And to see this totally outsider group of people come in and mirror that, it just made us feel so comfortable. I was like, okay, you guys get this. You're also yeah. a weird art family too. <laughs> you respect yeah, yeah. art and you're working on. It was really beautiful to see. You, you know, it's interesting is uh, on tour, we, the stage, the, the width of the stage, like Chris was saying, like sometimes we played on stages that were twice the width of the Hudson. Um, but with, you know, with Spike filming, we had to become acclimated and being able to play on the same stage for 16 plus weeks, uh, it became more comfortable for us. And so Spike had points where he would film on stage while we were performing. So because we had, you know, we were really comfortable with the spacings, um, that's kind of what brings it, you know, the audience on stage with us, because you're seeing it from different perspectives that you won't, you wouldn't see when you're sitting in the audience. So you're going to see like from above head or you'll see how our feet move. Um, and, you know, and also the sound is very important. You're going to see like different angles. Yeah. As you see the camera move in different places, you might hear like, you know, you're just really immersed in it. And I think that's what Spike did that made it really amazing and kind of bring it to life for everybody. Yeah, what I love about this show is that it goes beyond the music. So it's very optimistic, but also pretty political too. Like it really digs deep into a lot of issues that we're facing today and some issues that we might oftentimes want to just, it's more comfortable to sweep them under the rug. Um, Do you guys feel like this is a production that kind of forces people to come head on with those things and maybe take action? Uh, Predominantly, you know, uh, yeah, it it makes people think and you know, some some people did not like the fact that we talked about politics, or it's not even a political issue; it was a human issue. Yeah. Um, uh, it was very uh, nonpartisan when David would ask people to go register to vote. We had the head count where you could vote in the lot or register to vote in all the lot in the lobby. Um, but there's a lot of issues, and I feel like that's why the show's American Utopia. The d- diversity you see on stage, on stage, not you know, we still got to work on backstage and up top here, but the but the things that the American utopia, we want to see the diversity, the happiness, that's what's presented on stage. But then there are also a lot of things that we have to, we have to address the elephant in the room in order to obtain or to get to the utopia that we all, you know, want together. Starts up top. I mean, there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done, but the fact that it's starting to be addressed on these platforms and these larger stages, that's a good step. Doing the show every night was a very emotional experience. It wasn't like, we're just going to do a show. We're just going to get it done. We're going to go home. We're going to, it's just like what Angie was saying. It's like, it's not a political issue. It's, it's a human issue. It's civil rights. It's a matter of whether or not people should um, be allowed to breathe. Right. And so I think that, um, you know, there were definitely a lot of reactions in the audience. Um, some were very supportive, some were very closed off. And you can just tell because you can see the audience and especially, you know, where we are and how the lighting is. You can see the audience. You can see if they're closed off or you can see if they're open. And, you know, of course, our hope as artists is that we can use um, art to begin to open people's hearts and minds to the possibility that, hey, maybe there's something going on here. Maybe there's some other way of looking at something. Maybe, you know, we're not just right, left. Maybe there's some mixture. Maybe there's a lot of left and a lot of right that, you know, there's, there's, there's overlap, right? So I think what's so great about that is that people love David's music. They come to the show to hear the music. Um, but as Chris was saying earlier, he's, he's an artist with heart and he's, he's a person. You know, it's not just like, oh, I'm just this Devo, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Or diva, whatever you want to say. It's like, no, he's a, he's a person and that care mm-hmm. shows through. And it's like, people come for the songs and they get fully a, a, a full experience of him as an artist. And also us as the, the um, cast 
how we are as artists and as people and it's it's integrated it's not just like it's not like in your face but it's like hey let's look at this mm-hmm. let's look at this but also let's look at it seriously and our our hope always i feel like um you know when we're when we're singing these songs is that people will start to be like man maybe there's another way of looking at things for sure and yeah. i think in theater oftentimes that you're presenting or you're um performing for a privileged population absolutely white and privileged and don't necessarily and the thing with how you talking about it's a protest song it's forcing you to say their names so if you didn't want to turn on the news and hear it or if you didn't want to read that article you're here at this performance and you're going to listen and yeah. I, love, and, I love that you know what's cool like you, you soften them up with the hit song everyone's happy and then you're like <laughs> oh by the way don't forget reality but you know it shows like you know david's evolution and being so empathetic and sympathetic to what's going on in the world and that's what i really respect about david and i i feel very mm. grateful to be able to work with artists that are socially aware and make strides to evolve in their lifetime and you know we've heard may have heard stories in the past of how people were and then how people grow and change and life is constant evolution we're never too old it's not like okay this is how i am some people do just stop growing and they don't leave room for growth. And, you know, I mean, we all have blind spots, like I've told David before. And the fact that he's open to criticism or to be like, hey, we should look at this a different way or, hey, maybe this should be said this way. That just shows, who, you know, his integrity and who he is as a human being. And again, that's what I really love and respect about him. Yeah. And it doesn't seem like he's forcing it down anyone's throat. It's done oh. gently. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Charlie, you said something really key, which is that in Janelle Monae's song, How You Talking About, we're asking the audience to do a very simple thing. We're not mm. asking them to change their political party or to change, like, fund a certain organization or do anything that will drastically affect their personal lives in that mm-hmm. moment. Yeah. The song asks one to say the name of someone that was murdered because of police brutality or white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I I would encourage anyone watching the show at home on HBO when it comes out to say the names that we ask you to say. Mm -hmm. I think it speaks to the incredible, like, uh, facility and brilliance of 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 singing and speaking. Mm -hmm. When you speak something, like a theater, right? Like, by speaking this into existence, you are making it real. And you can't, if you listen to a list of names, all right, you might hear some of them for real. You might understand them or interpret them. But once you start repeating those names and actually saying mm-hmm. those words, saying those names, a Tatiana Jefferson, Sean Bell, Emmett Till, you can't unsay them. You have spoken mm-hmm. them. You are, you are kind of roped into this human accountability that we all really need to be a part of and so i encourage there's it 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 should be interactive you should say the names and then Mm -hmm. see what that does for you yeah and and one day hopefully that list stops growing like on tour and on the show like it's sad how often that 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 song can be updated you know we sang it in different languages when we're on the road we sang it in spanish and portuguese depending on which you know which area we were in and that's the dream. But again, that's the utopia where we can, where we no longer have to add, you know, name set list. And some of the performances we had some victims, family members yes. in the audience, or someone who filmed something happening was in the audience, came back, came around the theater afterwards. And mm-hmm. So yeah, it is very emotional. It's like you get choked up and you're trying to sing while you know this is going on, and it's just it's you know it's it's real. Yeah. Now, you guys represent um, three populations of underrepresented groups. For uh, Angie, you're a Black woman. Chris, you're a queer man. Jacqueline, you're a woman. What do you guys hope um, this, or what does this production mean to you guys? And what do you hope um, people who look like you or are like you get out of it? Oh, I just thought about, I, don't, I, don't, I should just, I just said a boat. I'm not, I'm not from Canada. I'm from Wisconsin, but very close. I just heard very close. <laughs> I, I think it was New York. There was this little Black girl, probably like, six years old it, yeah it was in new york it was on broadway this little girl in the crowd looking up her eyes were so big and i saw myself i saw myself 20 30 years ago and i was just like that really just melted my heart just to see the sparkle in her eyes and that's that's who we're doing this for these kids that 
we've got to keep the world together for that. You know, these kids need a chance in life. And so I, I feel like, you know, being able to be up there and represent that, you know, being on stage on a stage like that, and it, it just really meant a lot to me. And I, I think that's, Again, the representation is very important, and I, I appreciate the fact that David was willing to do that and diversify his band that way, because we all come from different backgrounds and, you know, different situations, and so, uh, yeah, I'm just really happy to be a part of that family to inspire these young young kids. I mean, she wrote me afterwards. Her mother or something found me on Instagram, and so, yeah, and she's learning guitar now. She want, You know, I gave her my guitar pick that day, so. That's sweet. I love that. That's definitely relatable. Like, I think the thing is, is like, there's a couple of people too who have written me on Instagram and said, my daughter loved your, your performance and she was inspired. And I think that, I mean, I can even think back to when I was younger, my dad's a musician and I would go to a lot of his shows and there was a certain point when I'd look up and I'd be like, where are all the girls? Where are they? Where are all the women? And I just literally didn't understand. I didn't understand why. And then I tried to make sense of it. And I was like, okay, maybe they're taking care of babies. You know what I mean? Like there's just all this stuff going through my mind and I'm like, oh, and, but the natural thing to then think is, well, oh, well then I can't do this. And it's completely disheartening when you're a child because you think, okay, well, I could do that. I'd like to do that. You know, is this, can I do that? Like nobody else has done it. And then, you know, there's like a, a number of people who have, have paved the way and also like being a drummer, uh, like a girl drummer, you know, Sheila E is our, is our queen. <laughs> she's the, she's the icon, you know, and that we all uh, aspired to be. And um, that kind of stuff is important. And I feel like it's funny even to say, cause it's just, a lot of it is just could seem visual, you know, like I, like, for example, I'm a woman, I'm also a white appearing woman, but my dad's Colombian. So I have like a mix there so there's like all kinds of things where it's like you could look up and see that and it could mean something or not but in some ways it's really important for for kids to see that especially and you know I don't want to take adults out of it because as my dad says it's too late when you're dead because people always ask him can I learn drum still he's like yeah it's too late when you're dead <laughs> why not try now right okay. but there is something important to the visual to being able to see hey is somebody like me up there and it just like it just warms my heart I know Angie probably same for you when you got those messages you're like wow it's just like you feel like you're making mm -hmm. such a difference in an individual's life for me it's this really weird thing because like in on the road I guess it was it was just weird to be a queer person in the rock music industry a little bit um, <laughs> I mean <laughs> anyone that saw Bohemian Rhapsody like they didn't they seemed to not really touch on that but it's a big deal like it's still pretty straight pretty straight world just mm -hmm. you know go f most things are um but broadway's the opposite almost so like it was this weird thing where i remember meeting some of the crew for the broadway show and they were like wait you're the only gay guy in the cast <laughs> <laughs> but just only the gay guy. I mean, you're talking to a queer woman too. You got tri triple minorities. See? See? We got she's we've got bases covered, okay? Right. Um, but, I love it. <laughs> but no, I mean I mean I think it's a the representation is a spectrum, right? It's not just about representing one just jack version of queerness, okay? Mm -hmm. It's about representing spectrums of identities. And so for me, I'm like on the road, I represented like a kind of queer glam rock backup vocalist identity that maybe like you wouldn't see next to David Byrne perhaps but on you helped me with my eye makeup too <laughs> and we have the dressing room on tour <laughs> we are sitting in my in my beauty room by the exactly. way exactly <laughs> um but I mean but then on on Broadway it was this this kind of other kind of representation where like Broadway is dominated behind the scenes and on stage by like white gay men basically mm -hmm. choreographers directors everybody i mean we're all over the place and as we're seeing with this kind of reckoning of broadway right now of these you know with we see you white american theater all of this stuff we're realizing that maybe that marginalized like queer gay representation really wasn't as egalitarian as as you know we maybe would hope like oh well they're gay i'm sure they're going to be probably great and not racist Mm -mm. No, we <laughs> we're right. still cis white dudes. 
by the way. Um, and so I think for me, anytime I get a chance to represent like a less than mainstream, less than uh, kind of like populist version of queerness, I try to do that. Like I'm not, I'm, I, and I, it's, I, again, it's not because I, I want to make, that's just who I am. Like I've never felt like I fit into the kind of cookie cutter, you know, white Broadway gay kind of archetype. And I know a lot of people do, I just never did. And so for me to be like, oh, I could be this kind of freaky, awesome, mustached, eye makeup wearing fabulousness on a stage that maybe in like another version would only see me kind of, you know, kicking my face and, and being beautiful in the background or something, you know, like, I don't know, it was, that, that feels like a triumph. <laughs> For sure. Last question. Did it surprise you guys how relevant? I mean, this music is, is decades old, but it's so relevant to today. Did, did that surprise you guys at all? It's timeless. It's contagious. You have, you, you have no choice but to groove with it. And I think that's what, that's again, comes to the foundation of what humanity is, being human. The heartbeat is what we all do share. We all have that the relevance of this music and these lyrics is like we we've been able to really fully absorb these words because we've done it and sung it so many times and i think an audience seeing it once gets so much i mean like a <laughs> lot like really a lot but if you can watch it more than once you're really gonna start absorbing like even deeper levels and i think it's a mm -hmm. testament especially in these kind of like quick Instagram attention span times. It's a testament to like taking time to write something and say something. And it just makes me, that is, it's so amazing how easy it is to forget that kind of thing of like, oh yeah, being in a place and watching something for two hours and listening to words for two hours and something that like theater can do that I, I don't think, I don't think Instagram can do. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, y'all. No shade to Instagram. It's no shade to Instagram. <laughs> I Follow don't work me. There. Follow me on Instagram. Right. Chris Giarmo. Follow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, David Byrne's American Utopia premieres on HBO and streams on HBO Max on October 17th. Thank you guys so, so much. This was so much fun. A big piece of Hope you got your Broadway fix. Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for new episodes. Have a great weekend.